Professor Henry Reynolds has published 20 books and over 60 chapters in books and articles in journals. Among his best known books are Other Side of the Frontier, The Law of the Land, This Whispering in Our Heart, The Fate of a Free People, Why Weren't We Told, North of Capricorn, Forgotten War and Truth Telling. He has written a large number of articles in newspapers and magazines given over a hundred interviews on radio and television, including major national programs, delivered public lectures and talks over Australia, including over 20 major named lectures in Australia, Britain, New Zealand, and Canada, addressed the National Press Club, has participated in all of Australia's major literary festivals in Perth, Adelaide, Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Hobart, Byron Bay, Canberra, Bendigo, Belgium. His books have won major literary prizes, such as the Prime Minister's Prize for Nonfiction, the Queensland Premier's Prize twice, the Human Rights Commission Prize for Literature twice, the Victorian Premier's Prize for Nonfiction, the Banjo Prize for Australian Book Council, and the Ernest Scott Prize twice. Most recent, his book, Forgotten War, won the Victorian Premier's Prize and was shortlisted for the Queensland Premier's Prize and the Tasmanian Literary Prize. His books and articles have widely been used as source material and inspiration for poets, filmmakers, songwriters, painters, novelists and dramatists. Professor Reynolds has received numerous other awards and distinctions, including honorary doctorates from the University of Tasmania and James Cook University. But what I like the most is in 1998, he was elected as one of the 100 National Living Treasures. Please welcome our keynote speaker this morning, Professor Henry Reynolds. Okay, well, well thank you very, very much for that welcome. Um, I would love to be there, but uh, many things meant that it was better if I stay here and shiver. <laughs> um, as many of you may know, I spent most of my uh, academic career in Townsville, and I arrived there in 1966 to begin teaching Australian history. Now, it wasn't just that I began my teaching there, uh, at that time, it was that I began teaching in North Queensland, which even then was very, very much closer to the frontier. Uh, it was an extraordinary place to discover the reality about Australia, which really and truly uh, I found shocking, uh, disturbing, inspiring. That is, inspiring me to begin the, you know, the telling of the story. And I've also many times uh, told people that it was a, it, it was a course that was uh, set in UQ, it was a UQ course. And the textbook for that course uh, was the book that had been edited by Gordon Greenwood, who was one of the great professors of, the U, of UQ. And it was, a, it was the most widely used textbook in Australia, Australia of social and political history. The extraordinary thing about it was it didn't mention the Aborigines except in two passing sentences. And there wasn't even an entry in the index. Now, I looked up all the reviews of this book. It was a multi author book, and if you weren't in the book, then you reviewed it. And look at one, look at one of, the, of, the, of, the, of the most prominent historians of the period realised there was something unbelievably wrong about this book. Now, I knew it was wrong because I was living in the middle of racial Australia. I was living in daily contact with many, many Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders, many of whom were friends, and, and of course my students knew that this was a profoundly important issue for them, had been and was to be in the future in North 
And so that's why I began doing the research. Had there been a, a, a library full of books on the subject, I would have just gone and read the secondary material. But there was nothing. There was nothing in the library about the true history of Queensland. So I began doing the research myself, and that took me eventually all over Australia, and also particularly to Great Britain. And so that's why um, what I came to see, I think, was that I was looking at Australia from the north down. And after all, Margaret and I were in Townsville for over 30 years. And so we, we became North Queensland. We became regional Australians, but above all, uh, you, you saw the history very differently if you looked at it from the north down. Now, this conviction has grown stronger, if anything, and in a way, this is one of the points I make in truth-telling, that the conquest of the north was a, a totally different part of Australian history. And I suggest to people, well, let, let's look at the situation in 1850. Now, in 1850, the British government, the imperial government, had made the decision that the Australian colonies, uh, apart from Western Australia, would become self-governing. They'd already done this in Canada, and this was to be the future of Australia. That meant that they would hand over all what was called the Crown land to the colonial governments, and the fate of all the First Nations people would be in the hands of the, of the colonial governments. Because the British, uh, having lost the American colonies, knew not to interfere with self-governing colonies. So, in 1850, there was almost no settlement in the whole of Northern Australia. I mean, a third of the continent with very, very large First Nations populations. In 1850, there were only 8,000 Europeans in Queensland. There were 4,000 in Western Australia, and there was none in the Northern Territory. So this was a new beginning, if you like, for Australian settlement. It was the move into tropical Australia with very large populations of First Nations people. But perhaps the critical thing, I think, was that this was a project of the Australian colonial governments. That is, and Brisbane after 1859. Brisbane after 1859, Sydney, Melbourne, Hobart and Adelaide. These, particularly by 1860, these were democratically elected governments with full manhood suffrage. They were among the most democratic communities in the world. But it was these governments, these parliaments, which carried out the conquest of North Australia. So this is the difference. Now, a lot of effort has gone into looking at Cork in particular, at Philip, at Macquarie, but that's a different story. And that is the responsibility of the British government. And if you want reparation and apology, look to London. When it comes to North Australia, you have to look at home. This was our doing and our responsibility. That is, as Australians, we can't escape that fact. Now, Queensland, in a way, was the most, the most outstanding example of the conquest of the North. Because, uh, you know, in South Australia, there was very, very little settlement north of the agricultural areas of South Australia. Western Australia remained a colony of Britain until 1890. So it is Queensland, from 1859 onwards, that was, above all, the, the leader of the conquest of the North. And remember, the Queensland pioneers, um, if you choose to call them that, as they have been called, they also 
took their cattle across the Northern Territory and into the East Kimberley, up into Cape York. It is Queensland that had the great responsibility for the conquest of the North. And in a way, I think that is, that may seem to be a simple and obvious thing to say, but I think it's something that is scarcely broken through into the consciousness of the community, that this is not Captain Cook, this is not Governor Fair, <coughs> this is the leaders of the, of the colonial parliaments. Now, in Queensland, in particular, I think it's important to concentrate on Samuel Walker Griffiths. And in particular, he uh, is one of those figures who were important in the late 19th century, who were either born Australian or came to Australia as children. And once again, these are people who are our responsibility. We have a responsibility to come to terms with their careers. And in particular, I choose three people. John Forrest, who's responsible for the whole conquest of the Kimberley. Uh, John, Sir John Downer, the South Australian, and Griffith. The three of them, remember, became Knights of the Realm. They were key figures in their colonial parliaments. They were key figures in the, in the federal you know, in, in, in Federal Australia. And Griffith in particular, <coughs> as you may know, he was in Parliament for 20 years, and much of the time a minister, either Attorney General or Premier. And therefore, he has to be responsible for what was happening out on the frontier, particularly across the North. Now, there is no escaping that. That is what responsible government means responsibility, no matter how remote the events are from Brisbane, these lead us back to the, camp, the council chamber, the cabinet table in Brisbane. And Griffiths, uh, you know, was, was central to that for much of the time, when the killing was probably more pronounced than anywhere else in Australia. And in particular, with the use of the Native Mounted Police. And there is no doubt, not only were, were the, the, the cabinet ministers in Brisbane responsible for this, but they clearly knew what was happening because the native police put in monthly reports. But there was also constant reporting about what was happening in the newspapers. No literate Queenslander in the late 19th century was not aware of what was happening out on the frontier. No one doubted this. The debate really was rather whether it was necessary. Was this an inescapable, an inescapable fact of colonisation? That is simply what you had to do. Uh, or was it those who said, no, really, this is, this is a terrible, immoral fact that will stain the colony for the rest of its, you know, rest of its life? And so this brings us to the question of Griffith. Why pick on Griffith? <laughs> well, he was only one of the colonial politicians who sat around the cabinet table. And he was quite young. Uh, he wasn't overwhelmingly powerful. But the point about Griffith that is we can't avoid is that he was above all a very, very prominent jurist, a lawyer. He was a person who, uh, in a way, worshipped the, the, the common law. He was the person who created the Queensland Criminal Code and helped draft the Constitution and then was the founder, the founding uh, Chief Justice of the Australian High Court. Griffith and the law are totally in, in intertwined and they can't be separated. So Griffith was the person who must have known. Now, it's quite likely that a lot of his colleagues, without his education and certainly without his legal training, uh, were not uh, immediately aware. They probably thought 
that the law that was perfectly legal and, and proper to kill black people. That is just what happened on the frontier. But Griffiths knew it was not only morally wrong, but above all illegal in two ways. One was that the Aboriginal Queenslanders were British citizens, British subjects. There was no avoiding that. That had been determined by the British. So that killing them was, was extrajudicial. It was, in short, it was murder. And then there was the problem of property. Now, all the settlement of North Queensland was done with pastoral leases, and they still exist. What people scarcely realised until the Wick case in 1996 was that the pastoral lease had been created by the British government and imposed on the Australian colonies to make sure that the Aboriginal people could not be driven off their land. It was illegal. It was illegal to force people off their own country and prevent them from returning to it. Now, that is extraordinary, that the whole of the settlement in North Queensland was done with an instrument that could have allowed for the, uh, the living together of people on country, as actually happened. But the Aboriginal people, no one, accorded them their legal rights. Now, once again, Griffith must have known this was the case. So it may seem that we're picking on Griffith, but we're picking on him partly because he was, above all, a great jurist and recognised as such. And yet he's involved in this long, long series of conflicts and violence and brutal deaths. There's no question about that. Now this brings us to the question that um, what, what, what has happened recently? Now in some ways all around in many parts of the world what we've seen is in a sense a recreation of you know really one of the, the final stages of decolonization and the calling to account of governments, particularly the American and the British governments, above all about slavery, and in America also about uh, lynching, which coincided very much with the conquest of the North, that is the height of lynching. So that there's also uh, demands to, for reparation and apology throughout the West Indies now about slavery. So this is happening in many places, and it is happening in the universities. Some of the greatest universities in the world are going through a process of coming to terms with their links to slavery and colonial oppression. And this is true of Harvard, Princeton, <coughs> Brown, the, the Ivies, the great Ivies of the east, east coast of the United States, but also universities in Britain who had links with slave and slavery. Now, there are many ways in which these universities are coming to terms with their legacy, their historical legacy. And I think that is the situation that faces Griffith University. It's preeminently a problem for the university and it's one that there are many, many possible ways in which the university can decide to come to terms with this legacy. And that is very much a matter for debate within the university itself, staff and students and alumni. It's above all uh, their decision, and I think they have to come to terms with it because that is what is being done by some of the greatest universities in the world. And if Griffith is unable to do the same, I think the reputation of Griffith will suffer seriously. So I leave it now with you to, to, to ask questions and join the discussion. Uh, there is no doubt that the world has caught up with Australia. It's caught up with the Australian the Australian colonial parliaments who were responsible for so much 
of the brutality of North Australia. And above all, it's caught up with Griffith because Griffith uh, does have a name that is a real problem. And that problem, I think, should lead to a great deal of creative thinking and a great deal of creative activity. It may well indeed be, in the long run, a blessing for the university. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave that with you now and it will be very interested in your questions or comments. We do have a roving mic, but it's very tiny. Um, but I think if you have a question, I can either rephrase it up here in front of the mic. You can just sing it out. Sing it out for Henry. Any questions? I'll throw one up there, Anna. Yeah. Um, the Australian space that we live in, identity-wise, in the 21st century, interests me. I hear a lot of the time we talk about Australia as if it was Australia from the beginning. Um, 1901 Federation was when we came together, so is the responsibility, coming back to what um, Professor was talking about before, about the, the responsibility of ourselves, is that a federal conversation or is that a state um, uh, separated conversation? Do they join each other as such, like Australia is joined? Uh, yes, I, I got the gist of that, and it's a very important and interesting question. I think, uh, I mean, in many ways, it's the states that are now most active in terms of moving towards uh, treaty, for instance, um, and also regional agreements. And in a, in a sense, that, I think, is going to be likely to be uh, where much of the movement will take place. Now, does that mean we're going to have a patchwork of treaties, a patchwork of regional agreements? Uh, I think that's quite likely. But the fact is that, I mean, the Commonwealth had very, very little, no responsibility for Aboriginal for First Nations at all until it took over the Northern Territory in 1912. And it didn't have any responsibility outside the territory until after the referendum of 1967. So that much of what was done in terms of Aboriginal, uh, you know, Aboriginal First Nations policy were, was done in, in the state parliaments. Um, and you know, I mean before, the, the, the British uh, administrations were administrations of the separate colonies and then they became self-governed. So I think whatever is done at the federal level, there are very, very strong reasons for there to be very serious activity in the states. After all, they had responsibility, and this is where overwhelmingly all the records are in the state archives, not in, not in, in, in federal institutions. So my belief is that Queensland does have a very, very challenging, uh, a, a challenge to come to terms with its history, regardless of whatever is done at the federal level. Any other questions? Yeah, Tony. Um, hi, Henry, Tony McAvoy here. How are you? Good day, Tony. Uh, just a quick question about the uh, the subject of whether uh, Aboriginal people were British subjects or not. I, I'm aware of the, the case law from the early 1800s where the Supreme Court of New South Wales considered the issue and made, made clear that it was the case, but it seems to me that that declaration that uh, Aboriginal people were British subjects was formal only and that in reality, the uh, Aboriginal people weren't given any of the uh, benefits or protections of, uh, of the, uh, that would uh, travel with being a British subject. And um, I, I come at it from the approach that it seems to me, and I, I find it very difficult to let go of the notion that there were a series of wars that were conducted. And um, it, it can't be 
avoided by saying that you, you know the British subjects so that it's rather than a war, it's a, it's a civil disobedience or something like that. Yeah, um, it, it's it's very much a matter of to what extent you know British law uh, was. Um, I, you know, overwhelm whatever the colonies did. Now, I have obviously felt for a very, very long time that what we what we're talking about is indeed uh, war, but uh, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't legally what it was, um, because there was no attempt to uh, act under the laws of war, which were fairly well known and. And, you know, increasingly observed, at least in in theory, in the second half of the 19th century. I mean, there was a lot of lot of work on on the laws of war, going you know right up, you know, right through into the uh, period when the conquest of the North was was proceeding. And it would not uh, alarm me at all if we indeed uh, come to the decision we really are talking about war, but. It, from the point of view of the First Nations, a series of wars. They were little wars. They were little wars between the incoming invading settlers and the small self-governing independent republics, which is what the, 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 the nations were. Um, and indeed, that's one of the great tasks, I think, for the next generation, is to trace the, the, the way in which the war uh, unfolded uh, in each nation, because each nation had to try and deal with this problem on its own. They knew what was happening elsewhere. But they made the decisions whether to, to fight or not, to avoid, um, when to stop fighting, when to come to an agreement, when to accept that your young people would go and work for the white fella. All of these things, I think, have to be seriously researched. And even the extremely valuable uh, map about uh, massacres, I mean, that has now to be put into the context of each of these separate little wars. So, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Uh, but what Queensland did, it, it in effect, said, well, we don't have to take seriously the idea that these people should be treated uh, with all the uh, complexity of the criminal law, you know, that, 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 you know, of, of, of you know, trials and sentences and arrest and, you know, all, all of the, you know, everyone knew that's what you did. And Griffith clearly knew that. Um, if you don't uh, have that, then you have to consider uh, this as war and look at it in terms of of war, and but it isn't just it isn't just the war. It's many wars, and that is going to be a, a, a really important and also in a way an exciting area of research for the next generation. Professor. Milligan, is it? Yeah, yeah. Milligan. <laughs> thank you, uh, Fiona, and thank you, Henry. That was excellent. So you'd um, you've given us a challenge here at Griffith to start a conversation. What do you think the barriers will be for us in trying to start that conversation? I didn't quite catch that. What um, you've um, put forward that Griffith University could have a conversation. What do you think the barriers are for us to have that conversation? Okay. Well, you would know that far, far better than I. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 well, one of, I mean, just, uh, I mean, I think the university has to take this seriously at the highest level and set up some sort of mechanism uh, where the, uh, you know, the, the real investigation and thinking about it has to take place. Now, one place you could start is simply to the Griffith University to quickly put on, uh, you know, uh, people or even people that already work within the university 
to find out what other universities have done, particularly in America and Britain. Uh, this would be a great help, particularly if Griffith then wants to go to the state government and say, we've got this very, very great and important project, and we think uh, it is a uh, you know, there, there is a case for special funding from the state government to forward this process. Uh, so that, you know, to, to just know what, it, what has been going on elsewhere, and that will always help you, you know, to persuade uh, governments that Queensland itself should also uh, come to terms with this and, and you know, obviously provide money. Uh, you know, there's a limit, presumably, to what Griffiths can fund out of its immediate resources, which probably are all ticketed and marked off for the next three years. Whatever. So, um, yes, I mean, but then there's, you know, I, I think the university should have sh throw open the debate uh, to the community and say, what do you think we should do? Uh, you know, both the First Nations and, and the general community and just see what sort of response you get. But Griffith itself should come up with with projects. You know, e even if you begin with scholarships for doing essential research. Uh, I mean, essential research on Griffith himself. Um, one suggestion I made, which would be, I think, an exciting public thing to do, and you've got a, a, a large law faculty uh, which prides itself on being concerned with human rights and you know, international human rights, hold a mock trial of Samuel <laughs> <laughs> Crimes Against Humanity. I'm serious. And this would dramatise and you know, get some you know, get some of your you know, some of your most leading lawyers to argue this in front of a big audience. Uh, and that is, you know, that would be a most dramatic way to hear the arguments. Uh, there are all sorts of creative ways in which uh, this can be done. You know, promote, uh, you know, artistic work uh, to, to deal with this. I mean, we already have some of it quite obviously, but there's much more that can be done see it as, as as an opportunity rather than a bird. I think we have room for one more question. Just out of curiosity, Henry, who would you name the university after? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I have, I have to think about that. Um, and in a way, <laughs> in a way, I'm, I'm handballing it. Now, that's Australian rules. <laughs> I'm passing it to to the university and to Queen. That is above all a Queensland decision. Uh, I'd be most interested to see what names that, that people come up with, or whether they feel that they should keep the name, but in a sense own the name in its full meaning, and uh, therefore, uh, you know take action. Now, um, it's very interesting what, you know, some of the most significant figures in American history have been uh, disowned. I mean, Princeton has removed the name of Woodrow Wilson from their buildings. Mm -hmm. Now, he was the, the president of the university before he became the president of the United States. You know, one of the great presidents in many ways, the founder of the League of Nations, and yet Princeton one of the great intellectual powerhouses of the Western world has got rid of the name Woodrow Wilson, but they haven't. Uh, uh, but once again, I don't know whether they've given those buildings another name. But it's that sort of detail, uh, how the other big universities have dealt with this. Um, both I mean, Harvard removed, uh, you know, because Harvard had uh, the law school had been funded by slavers, and so they have removed names there. But it's it's um it's you know I don't think it should be made a decision made quickly, but I think it should be very much on the agenda 
Um, and if they don't actually use these names, they should do much more to recognise the names of the people who stood out against what was happening. Now, Fieldberg uh, was, was a clip, uh, absolutely critical one. But in the 20th century, another extremely important Queensland that was Mary Binner. Now, these people should be recognised, if only with scholarships. Uh, there are other people who, who stood out and often suffered because they said what is happening is wrong. Uh, so that, uh, as I say, there's, there's much that can be done, but the museum, you know, one of the, one of the things that was very similar in America was that, that, that lynching was at its height during this period, if you like, the Griffiths period. Now, it was against the law, but no one in the South thought the law should be obeyed. And lynching just went on. Only just passed a federal law against it in the last couple of weeks. But uh, in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, is that right? I think so. Uh, they've opened you know, a fabulous uh, museum of, of, of lynching. Now, I don't think the federal government has been doing this quickly. The War Memorial is clearly completely dropped the ball, and I don't think you know, we should give them the chance to retrieve their reputation. <laughs> <laughs> Queensland should set up the Great Museum of Frontier Conflict. So, and what you call that, I don't know, but I mean, you know, if Australia can spend a hundred million dollars on a war memorial in northern France, <laughs> celebrating, commemorating the, 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 the Australian army in the First World War, um, that's not, you know, $50 million would probably do to begin a museum which Griffiths could take over the, con you know, the, the, the responsibility for developing and conserving. I'd uh, like to thank Professor Henry Reynolds, and can you put your hands together for the keynote this morning?